Good evening. Welcome and welcome to the Business of Property. I'm your host, Cheryl Leon for Property Development Australia. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So at the Business of Property, we interview superstar guests in the property development space that share their expertise, their deals and stories to help empower, build and grow our community of property developers. So hello there, Facebook land, LinkedIn and YouTube. Give me a shout out if you are here with us today. And so we're actually going to be speaking to David Engram, um, co-founder and CEO of Crowd Property and also Daniel. He who are part of this really interesting uh, marketplace lending platform that brings together um, small and medium residential property development. Um, you know, so we've got development and we've got finance here and these guys have been able to bring this platform to Australia that does it in, in a really ingenious sort of way, which allows sort of peer to peer, to peer lending. Um, so people wanting to invest in, in developments to people who are looking to get finance for development. So without sort of further ado, I'd love to invite the both of them down onto the Property Development Australia dance floor. Welcome to the Business of Property, gentlemen. Hello. Hello, hello. hello. Ian's here, excited to see you all. Good to see a rose between thorns. At the moment, the rose looks like David. So thank you <laughs> in the screen. So, um, David, tell us tell us a little bit about I guess your your background. Um, you are obviously no stranger to um, the prop tech space. Tell us a little bit about your background and I guess how this concept of crowd property has come about. Yeah, thanks, Joe. You're right. Um, on my previous business uh, was actually called Split It. Um, well, you're right. It was in the prop tech space, and uh, we bought we brought a slightly more transparent uh, business model to uh, actually at the time utilities connections and uh, and then on to financial products like mortgages. Um, so ultimately that business went on to be part of the loan market group uh, where I started working there with the brokers and started to understand, I guess, some of the real pain points for small property developers. I guess up until that point in my journey, we were all about uh, comparison and about transparency and, you know, Finance was much for muchness. It was a product. It was a commodity. Um, and, you know, when we've probably all looked at our, our home loans and compared them and we've been looking at the lowest rates. Um, I guess when I started talking to property developers, I started to understand there's a whole world of pain out there when just trying to yeah. deal with, with the banks. Um, so that's where this kind of search for, um, I guess, an alternative funding solution came from. Yeah. And what, what were those pain points that you've identified? Because I know you did a, a massive survey across Australia to try to understand, you know, what the experience is um, and, and what sort of has come out of out of that. Yeah, I, I think some of these things will be very familiar to the audience this evening. Um, in fact, have we got the slides? Can you see those? Because we might be able to just um, show you a few results of those surveys. Put this, put this together. I And... I love it, um, those of you that are that are joining us here today. You know, what are the pain points that you um, you're experiencing or have experienced dealing with, whether it's um, the banks or any other lenders? What are the pain points that you're you've experienced in your financing journey so far? I love love to hear. Yeah, as I said, I think some of these things will really resonate with the audience. Can you see the quotes we've got up on the screen there, Cheryl? Yeah, I do. Yeah, oh, no. so um, this the next, I think the next slide. Okay. Hey. Have you got that now? I still see property finance by property people. Ah, okay. How do we progress this along? <laughs> slight technology. Anyway, I can I can talk to it while we figure out the technology. So, um, actually, as as part of, uh, we went into the first lockdown, we were talking to uh, developers online and some of these are the quotes which came out of it. Um, you know, things like, 
Uh, you know, banks might look cheap money, but it's actually a higher price you pay in the end. That one really resonated with me. I really remember that. Um, nobody understood property. Um, you know, as part of the journey, there were, there were many surprises along the way. Um, you know, there were cheap money from the banks, but you really had to do the dance to get there. So um, I think the, the, the key point for me was really that nobody understood property. So there's, there's certain things which bank lending makes a lot of sense for. Um, but if your project kind of fall, falls outside of that category, um, you're really left um, a little bit stranded. Yeah. And Daniel, Daniel, being obviously part of the crowd property team now, but an active developer as well, which, which of these statements resonated predominantly with you? Oh, look, all, all of them, um, and I think you know, speaking to speaking to um, our, our fellow developers, you know, and, and it's not uncommon to um, to be you know you know three to six months before you before you receive any any money from the banks. But at the same time, it's not being able to talk to the right people that you want to, um, being able to uh, being put through like five different sections of a, of a bank only to get an answering machine um and and that's just the the, the 10th phone call right <laughs> so um so these are just some of the examples and, and and part of my um uh joining crowd property was actually through my own pains of, of banging my head against the wall figuratively speaking and, and realizing that there is got to be a better solution out there and so uh, and so here I am on the on the other side, hopefully helping developers to uh, to get better finance. Absolutely. So tell tell me what I mean, and, and I'm sure that the audience would like to to understand where does crowd property sit in in this landscape now, where we've got sort of your first tier lenders, you've got you know second tier lenders, and then you've got private funding. Also, you've got brokers, brokers, you know, commercial brokers that are brokering different lenders. Where does crowd property sit in all of this? Yeah, I'd say we're actually an alternative to, to all of those channels. We uh, primarily, I think importantly, we want to deal with um, developers directly. So the broker channel is, um, is not necessarily, it's one we could potentially use, but it's very important for us to actually talk to a developer, not only understand that their project stacks up, but understand what are their motivations for doing the project. Uh, and kind of really help them along that journey. And I guess the concept is about property people. So that piece about going to finance here and trying to find someone who understands your project, that's where we want to be and we want to add value. So yes, we do the same due diligence. We perhaps do more due diligence than perhaps the banks do, but it's on the project. And, and part of that, we're, we're adding value in that process. So on the other side of it, we're providing project opportunities to uh, investors. So. Um, here you can come onto the platform, um, you can look at projects, you can decide, you know, you'd like to meet that developer via a webinar online, you can see all the details about their project, you can select a project to invest in and, and back, um, and you'll get a, you know, a target 7% interest rate return, uh, all first mortgage secured and, and a short term loan of around averages about 15 months on the platform. So it really is, uh, I guess, bringing the platform brings together both the investor side and the borrower side. Um, the, the platform is interesting from a technology point of view, but at its core, as I say, it's all about that property people lending to property people. Yeah. I'd like to just highlight that bit about investors just briefly because it's not something that traditionally, I'd say, the everyday mum and dad investor has access to. So I'm familiar with private lending but typically say if you need to borrow you know two three five ten million you know most lenders like to work with one you know high net worth uh, ultra high net worth investor so what is this allowing investors what sort of investors are, are um are accessing these opportunities yeah, so at the moment, the platform in Australia is open to wholesale investors. Ultimately, it will be opened up to all investors, so it's retail investors, as they're called. Uh, the minimum investment is only $10,000, which, again, is very different to, I think, the ones you're referring to, Cheryl, which um, often have much higher thresholds for you to invest in deals. Um, yeah. So this allows you to come onto the platform and perhaps invest across, you know, could be a self-managed super fund, for example, or you could invest for a company or as an individual, and you can diversify your investment across a number of um, different projects. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, I mean, let's, let's dive a little bit further as to, I guess, further into the type of problem that you're solving and how you're solving that for developers, particularly developers in that small scale, um, you know, who are in that small scale sort of um, uh, level in, in the development game. Um, yeah, it's all right. I'm just, um, so yeah, I just uh, I think the point of difference where we we kind of play. Um, just going back to that research piece, if I can, just quickly. Um, we when we we obviously ask developers what they thought about um, their existing finances, um, but when we when we broke that down, um, the most important things people wanted from, and this is the problem I think we're solving, which is around transparency. Um, about speed and access to finance, how easy it is to do that. Um, really importantly is those access to those decision makers. Um, when we break that down a little bit further, um, if we look at the less experienced developers, they're typically coming to us trying to, you know, make that spreadsheet stack up. Mm. Um, and they're, yeah. Um, so that's about how much can I borrow? Uh, what's the interest rate going to be? What fees do you charge? Mm. And for those people who've been through the journey before, it really comes down to, um, actually, it's more about the, the non-financial issues with finance, which is kind of interesting for us. So how do we get ease and certainty of capital? Um, and you can see that on this chart here. You can see that red line there. Um, the interest rates for those experienced developers is not actually the most important thing. Mm, that's um, what I've noticed. I might just get you guys to move your slide a bit so we can have a look yeah, at right. yeah. the lines that you're talking about because that's, that's the thing that stood out for me. Like we often think it's interest rate, but from from your particular graph here, so this one's for um, experienced developers, and it shows like interest rate is way down. <laughs> yes, if you look at the diversity, so the, the top line, that faint green line on there is actually those uh, less experienced. They've done maybe one or two projects behind them, and they're placing a lot of importance on what's your rate. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the experienced guys, you can see, um, you know, where that red line peaks there, it's actually access to decision makers, it's speed, um, it's transparency. These are the things which mm -hmm. I guess people who have lived and breathed it have been through, um, have experienced before. So. Um, I think this just helps you when you're next talking to financiers about what's actually important and some of the questions you should be asking. What do you mean by transparency? Um, well, if we actually roll on this, there's um, a very, very good point. Uh, here's, a, here's an example on transparency. Um, how many people actually know what the penalty rates are? So if, if we all know projects overrun, right? Um, so what happens at the end of the day? Very few people could even actually answer that question. Mm. Um, what's even more disturbing, actually, when we look at, I guess, some of the other lenders out in the market um, is around, I guess, some of the hidden fees, which you don't see. Mm. Um, so, for example, we've seen um, projects which are quoted on quarterly interest. So that means if your project overruns by just a day, you finish up paying a whole other quarter of interest. Um, you know, there's penalty fees on top of penalty rates. Um, you know, margins are added on top of professional fees. So these are all the all the kind of pain points we see, um, which come out of that lack of transparency. And these are, I mean, you know, you highlight these, and like you said, often people probably, unless they've got their solicitor going through their lending agreement and documents with a fine tooth comb and explaining to them what it means it might actually just get lost in all the legal the legal stuff because often you know the um, loan documents can be about that thick um and you know um i've sat down with our lend uh our solicitor before and he's gone through almost every single clause to pick these things up mm. but the scary thing like you said if it gets just lost, lost in the loan documents. Where does that leave people in, in terms of, yeah, I'm going to pay off the loan early. Yeah, we're going to slap you on. Yeah. on these. 
face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've just had a case, I think, this week um, where someone was actually looking to do that. They were looking to refinance um, and they came to us um, looking for, you know, better rates, uh, but also, you know, service ad, which is going to allow them to go to the next project and next project after that. But when they actually looked at, um, you know, the fine print, it was it was not going to stack up in terms of the penalty rates, which yeah. we're going to right. hit with. So we have a very different model. We're very transparent. Uh, we only charge one success fee once we successfully raise funds um, for the project. And that's just on the drawdown. So we don't uh, we don't charge you up front for the whole of the loan. It's just for that initial cash flow drawdown. Um, and then there are no other um, no other fees in there. So you know, for example, um, if you if you want to, uh, you know, if you if your project runs to time or even early, there's no early penalty fees. For example, mm-hmm. Cameron's joined us today, and he says interest rate is of little use. You waste time chasing it, and you don't end up getting funded because the funder just didn't get it. Yeah, absolutely. And so how, how is Crowd Property providing a solution to this? And I'm really keen to understand, again, I'm sure the audience is, how this compares to what's available at the moment. Yep. So, yeah. so the solution is, is remarkably simple, actually. Um, if you go on to the next slide there, we've got, we've got an illustration of just how complex um, people try and make property. There's... As we all know, there's plenty of people in there trying to click the ticket. There's profit pools, there's inefficiencies. So what our platform allows you to do, as we said before, build that direct relationship with both the investor and the developer. Um, so that allows us, um, from an investor point of view, to pass those efficiency back on into better returns than you might get otherwise. Uh, and for a developer, as I was saying before, it allows us to kind of add that value without um, you having to potentially pay to go for a broker, um, for example. Um, so yeah, it is. It's a very simple. It's a transparent um, model which we which we offer. Uh, we know speed is important, as we've shown from from the research. So being able to come back to you with a, a term sheet within just a few days of contacting is, and that term sheet won't change. So it's not like you'll go through the whole process and then suddenly we'll turn around and say, uh, we we forgot about this. There's a fee for that, or you know now you potentially have to service that loan. So not only is it offers speed, that offers certainty. So you know what you're working with from there. From there on, we go into a, a due diligence process. Um, but you know it's uh, once we get to the point where yeah we're happy to go. We do an independent valuation, and a project goes up on the platform. Typically, once the loan is settled, uh, our developers are paying from around eight percent per annum and for a loan period is somewhere between 16 to 18 months average on the platforms about 15 months at the moment as i mentioned before there's only only one fee only on the funds drawn down so that means no line fees um no early repayment fees um yeah we offer first mortgage and probably better lvrs than potentially some of the other lenders or traditional lenders so you up to 70 percent based on grv um, and for the right project we can also look at potentially stretching that with a, a second mortgage capability as well yeah and uh, david i did want to find out with is it do you just have one interest rate or is that sort of in relation to the risk you know, oh, the risk appetite for that particular project. Yeah, absolutely, Cheryl. It's it's like any uh, any project, it's based on risk and complexity. So, yeah, yeah. there'll be a range from probably around that 8 up to 10% mark. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And But the good thing, like you were saying, is that it's the interest rate and then there's a success fee and that's it. There's no other... Yeah, like, and sometimes people will look at that and go, particularly if they're coming from, um, you know, traditional banking loans of, you know, 3 4% being charged, that looks high. Uh, and Daniel can explain a little bit about um, what that, what the difference is going to commercial finance and how we can actually help you grow your business because you can access those funds faster. We'll enable you to go into more projects, into bigger projects, um, which actually it stacks up in the end for everyone involved. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, let's let's have a look at that because one of the things that I know when we spoke about um, before was how does this compare to the banks, the brokers, and where does crowd property sit here? 
Um, and at the end of the day, developers want to have a level of certainty. That's the main thing. Whether I'm going to get funded, what those rates are, and to get a real quick response on that. Absolutely. So we've put together a bit of a comparison table so everyone can see that uh, hopefully clearly there. Um, so there's a there's a range of points, but start from the top and make our way through. One of the first things that, that we're concerned about as developers is actually speed. When when can I actually get funded so I can actually go and, and, and build the thing, right? So um, so with us, we're, we're looking at anywhere between sort of three to six weeks, whereas with a, with a traditional lender, you're, you're looking at anywhere between three to six months from application to when you when you get your money now. That, that's a that's quite a significant difference. That's that's potentially uh, one and a half to to, to many months, um, and you, you just you know you're literally just banging your head against the wall during during that period. Um, we all have funding available. Uh, we've all got funds. Uh, you know whether it's crowd property, broker, banks. There's all funding available. Um, property expertise. That's a that's a big one. Um, are you actually talking to somebody who understands what you're trying to achieve here? Uh, now, I just want to be clear at Crowd Property, we don't finance uh, motor vehicles, we don't finance equipment, <laughs> planting equipment. We finance property developers, and that's that's all we do. Um, day in, day out, um, our team has development experience, um, and, we, and we do our own developments as well. Um, so we're, we're happy to use that expertise to, to, to talk about the deals that you've got you've got running. We spoke about transparency earlier on. Um, access to the access to the decision maker. I think that's a that's an important one. Um, you know, when we sign off on our emails, um, we, whether you're talking to myself or another member of the the borrower team, um, we've all got our uh, phone numbers, so you can actually call us. Um, and I'm happy to admit I don't have a separate um, <laughs> crowd property phone. It's, you know, when you when you come through, you, you you get me directly. So we're happy to have a conversation uh, conversation directly with you. Um, higher LVRs potentially um, potentially, and we can go through some examples later of how we can allow you to have to make best use of the equity that you have. Um, essentially, putting your own money in to make um, best use of of that equity in in deal in one deal or multiple deals. We spoke about having a second mortgage available where we can increase those LVRs even further, again, allowing you to lever up to do bigger and more deals. Um, and we assess individual deals on merit. So what that means is we look at one deal that you have on its own merit, irrespective of what your income is, irrespective of how many investment properties you hold, irrespective of what other deals you've got running. We, we only look at that deal on its own merit. So we can lend based on just that deal. And just on that, just on that, Daniel, because we are looking at sort of the the smaller scale develop developments and developers, um, how do you look at developers who are just doing their first or their second deal? You know, their first three deals. How do they get assessed? Yeah, I mean, we we look at um, people doing their first and second deals, and we say, look, if you, you don't need to have done six or ten deals to to get funding um if you've done one uh, that's of a similar size great if you if you haven't done one uh we look at you and say look are you getting any mentoring from a from a group are you being guided by people who have done this before and we look at that quite favorably actually um and we know that those people who uh, who have done it before are happy to contribute and we we can look at it from from that perspective okay great so say if um i guess if someone's got a project manager in the project being able to sort of leverage off that experience as well or i mean uh, being an experienced developer as well you can sort of have a look at the numbers to see if they actually do stack up that's, that's actually a really good point cheryl um it's really interesting we've got an example of this later on where somebody may be a project manager or a development manager for a for a very large developer doing hundreds of millions of dollars of deals yet they can't get funded on their very first small uh small scale development so uh so they're the things that we look at and go yep you've got far more experience than than um than a lot of people um so we, we we're happy to fund um and mm. take experience from other areas as well yeah i think that's a that's a really um critical point particularly with the, the private funding um that i have found 
uh, just speaking to different developers that they're like, this is my first deal, but the um, private funder won't fund me because it's my first deal. Um, and understand, you know, that's their risk appetite. But I, I think the fact that you're saying, hey, we will look at it and we will assess whether it actually stacks up because you're doing some level of due diligence yourself as well. Yeah, and I think that's the difference, again, being able to talk to decision makers who've walked in your shoes before, right? So they, they understand where you're coming from and it's the yeah. ability to then look at the whole team. So we don't automatically reject it. You know, we have a we have a credit policy which does mean that we can look at, um, you know, developers early in their stage of the career, but then we have to look at some other things. So we look at, you know, who's, you know, as Daniel says, who's in the team around them in particular is very important. Are they getting coaching? Um, you know, how much skin have they got in the game, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's just a difference in approach to, I guess, you know, falling outside of that and instantly getting a, you know, computer says no type of yes. response. Yeah, absolutely. Computer <laughs> says no. Daniel yeah. says no. Um, well, I, I want to share my own experience because one of the things, and we'll come to the next part, is that um, it's not just development finance. You've got a whole range of different, um, for want of a better word, products, I guess. Hmm. Or, or different types of development or stages of development um, that you can find. I'd like to you to sort of just briefly walk through this because, yeah. you know, one of the reasons why we connected was I, I, I not only was attracted to the fact that you've got this crowd, you know, peer-to-peer -peer funding model where you're giving people, yeah. access, investors access to the ability to fund development deals but also fund these co-living yeah. projects we have. So it's about... You know, um, giving more people access to to um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Um, affordable rentals, mm -hmm. and then more people access to different ways to grow their wealth as well. So, um, mm -hmm. love for you to talk us through what other types of de you know products and developments you can fund, which are outside the norm, I guess. Yeah. So the f the first thing is obviously development finance. So if you're if you're uh, buying to settle the land and you're and you're looking to develop and build, um, we obviously do that. That's our bread and butter. That's our at the core of what we do. But beyond that, um, we, we've got situations where it's a bit more complex. Um, and this is where we this is where we play to our strengths in, in terms of helping you as a developer to to get your finance through. So one of those things is if you're doing a joint venture partnership with the landowner or if you're doing a JV with uh, with um, uh, somebody who's putting money into the deal uh, or a combination of those um, we're, we're very happy to, to look at those deals um, it's it's nothing is too complex for, for, for us from that perspective uh, we also look at things like uh, boarding house co-living uh, HMOs uh, as, as well um, so if you're if you're if you're doing something of, of that scenario we're, we're happy to look at Look at those uh, those deals. Uh, have a look at residual stock finance. Um, although there's not, um, there's yeah, there's not there's not a lot of residual stock sticking around in the market these days. Uh, but 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 an example of that might be if you're doing a four townhouse development um, and you've uh, sold two, um, but you found a, the deal of the century and you want to get into the next deal, we can potentially look at financing you out so you're not having to take the the next. You know, low ball sale just to get into the next deal. You can actually hold out for the for the pricing that you want, um, mm. and that's the sort of flexibility that's built in to allow you to do more deals. Um, modular finance um, is another one. So, uh, modular builds um, mm. or, or building methods that are slightly out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the box and, and 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 something that's a little bit different. We, we're happy to look at those uh, in the traditional methods of building that we obviously finance, but there are modular builds that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking three weeks rather than um, rather than six months before you get the, 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 the shell complete built and, 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 um, and locked up. So, uh, so happy to look at that. Um, really keen to, to talk a little bit further about that, Daniel, because I, I mean, I've looked into, into modular and prefab build before and a lot of funders wouldn't look at it because they'd be like, well, you know, actually, essentially, you almost have to have funds funds straight up, um, mm. or a, at least fifty percent deposit down, um, because it it what it didn't it didn't fit into the normal drawdown schedule mm. that finances have. So I think this this 
this on its own is a really, really unique um, lending product there. Yeah, and I think, you, you know, modular uh, modular bills have been around for, for quite a while now, but if you've looked at it maybe five, six, seven years ago, uh, it might be worthwhile just looking at it again because the technology has improved, um, costs have come down dramatically, and so the combination of, of those two factors actually can make a lot of those deals stack up from a from a developer perspective. Um, yeah. The yeah. So and the other ones would be um, yeah airspace um, as well. So if you're if you're sitting on a property that has air rights above, that may be worth something uh, to you or to a developer. Um, yes. Yes. Like, we spoke to Warren from Buy Airspace a yeah. few a few months ago. So. That's, that's exactly the thing that you're, you're funding, um, which, again, is very unique because I don't know a lot of funders that understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and things like NDIS as well, which is, again, um, quite specialised, but we see that as being um, quite underfunded, actually. Um, there's a lot of the, the barriers that are stopping more of these from going up is... Is, uh, is is the funding because we know at the back end the yields are very very good uh, very good um, it's just about getting the finance to, to fund them and, and build them as well so. yeah, absolutely we've got a question from Subot who's asked what sort of paperwork do you need to see yeah good good question Subot. Um look um, I would just say, look, it, it takes less than five minutes to enter some details onto a website to apply to start the conversation. Um, but in terms of paperwork, that's <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, ideally, uh, an IM would be would be very nice. An information memorandum that contains, you know, um, basic information like why you got into the deal, what you see in this deal, what are some of the numbers. Tell us about the location. Tell us about what you're building. Tell us about how you've thought about. Um, the end product that you're that you're trying to build and, and who you've targeted that to, um, and tell us about maybe the the consultants um, that you've that you've got on board, who the builder may be. Um, so yeah, so if you've got an IM, that'd be ideal. But but if not, um, we're also happy to look at um, sort of more piecemeal information <laughs> as as well. Suppose. Yeah, I think we could probably run another session with Cheryl actually on uh, on on information and how to provide it actually because we do see a very varied quality of uh, I guess um, yeah submissions which come through to us. But um, I guess that's also slightly different model because we know that's the way it works. Uh, there's no penalties for coming and having a conversation. So Daniel's right; you can pick up the phone and and people like this have, have you almost used it like a bit of a badge of honour in the past of actually getting funded through the project because well you know not all projects get up onto the platform right. We've got a, yeah. a strict due diligence process which we need to have to, to protect our investors and their investments um, but there's nothing to stop you coming and getting a second opinion on your project so getting an opinion from a, a lender and going does this project stack up it's actually quite valuable particularly if you're at you know the early stages of working out whether it's something you want to go forward with or not and we unlike other lenders there's no black marks we put against you so you know we might have seen two or three projects from the same same borrower potentially before we go yes actually this is the one you want to fund because this one makes sense okay each time you've been through that process you know you probably learned a bit on that journey so yeah sort of not unlike sort of residential uh, re residential lending where you might put an application with you know one of the one of the big four banks and they've turned you down you sort of get a credit it almost shows up in your your credit um your credit file um we've got a few more questions coming through Subodes um, asked if you consider an asset management type of funding. I'm not quite familiar with what that means. Maybe you guys do. Asset management. Um, as in, Subodes, do you mean um, looking at your assets versus income? Is that what you're, what you're referring to? Um, if, if that's what you're asking, Subodes, um, that's, yeah, that's it. You know, we, we look at the deal on its own merits. Um, we, we don't look at um, construction uh, and hold. Build, build to hold. Yeah, I'd say it's sort yeah. of similar to the, the co-living um, boarding house space, I guess, and NDIS. 
Yeah, so probably the simple answer to that is we'll do the construction part of that and then you'd look to refinance because obviously this is commercial lending so it would be at higher rates for that period and then you'd look at um, you know perhaps refinancing that out of a commercial um, type product. Uh, reason for that is simply again it's transparency on the other side of it we've got investors who want to come in and back these projects but they want to back them for a finite period of time. Um, so typically as I said the typical loan period sort of 15 months and then our investors can get their principal and interest returned and then go on to the next project so, yeah, yeah. Um, we've got someone who's asked do you fund at multiple stages of a development example client has funding to lock up stage and needs to fund to complete needs to fund to complete okay so we um we take a first mortgage on um on lens so we typically uh need to have a look at refinancing out the the previous lender on a on a deal um, if that's what you're, if that's what you're looking to do, um, but perhaps we can, we can talk about specifics of a, of a deal. If you've, if you've got that mind in mind, feel free to get in touch and we can, we can have a chat around that because every situation is different. Um, be keen to see why you're needing that funding and, and where you are with your project. So happy to, happy to discuss. Cool. Well, I think if it would be a good time to sort of dive into some, Oh, there we go. Some case studies, some examples. Hmm. And what are we what are we doing here, Daniel? Uh, we're doing a comparison between crowd property funding and traditional bank funding. Yeah, it, it's exactly right. So what we're looking to highlight is, as a small scale developer, how do you, through commercial finance, get into more deals, and how do you get into bigger deals with the ultimate aim of um, making more profit at the back end and, 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 and building more more of the product for for, uh, for people to move into or for investors to, to purchase essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, so we'll, we'll get straight into it. So um, we'll use a hypothetical James here. He's a, he has a full time job. He's he's relatively new to property development. Um, and this this here is a one into two townhouse development. Uh, his second development that is that he's done. Um, He's close to his borrowing capacity and he's looking to transition to do development full time eventually and wants to do potentially two to three projects um, in a year and aiming to limit the amount of equity required for, for, for projects. Okay, so we're, getting, we're going to get into some, some numbers here. Um, but the key things to, to run through are just some basic economics. So we're purchasing the land at a million. We're, constructing at 1.1 1 .1. um, we've got total costs with things like inch um, interest compliance consultants fees we're looking at about 2.3 million in total costs and we've got a development profit of uh, just over 500,000 and we've got a relatively healthy margin here at 22.6 uh, percent profit on costs now this is done with traditional bank lending when the interest rate is a little bit lower, um, you're looking at 3% for the period of the development for 15 months. Um, and you're putting in 30% of the cost in as equity. Um, so what that means is the, the amount of money that the developer is putting into the deal, sitting at 700,000. And um, we've got a return on that equity of, of 75%, namely the, the profit of 500,000. So this is your traditional bank lending. So what about with what about with us um, or with commercial lending, right? Um, oh, sorry, Daniel. Sorry to interrupt there. Um, the thing as well, I guess, with traditional lending is typically they may have the requirement that you've got pre that you need pre sales. Probably not a one into two, or well, probably a one into two. Yeah, exactly. Um, bank lenders will will have uh, what's called debt coverage, so they will say, look, how much of your development do you need to sell that covers the amount of debt and it could range anywhere between you know 50 percent to i've seen 100 percent debt coverage they want you to completely de-risk it for I've them i've heard brokers talk about like 110 and 120 percent which um mm. sounds like airline seats to me but um, yes <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah it's and it, what it does is it stops you from getting on with the project right you, mm. we talk about this momentum when we're building and when we're developing um, and if you're requiring 120% of coverage of debt, like that's, that's just mm. money, 
you could you could be getting into other projects or finishing up your project really yeah particularly when i mean in in the current climate where a lot of people are developing sort of owner occupier stock and a lot of the owner occupiers want to see the completed product and want to mm. do the whole touch and feely thing we're not we're not i'm not finding as many people doing as uh, as many off the plan sales as they used to mm. Absolutely, and and especially with owner occupiers. I mean, why why do we do developments, right? We somebody eventually moves into the house, and and particularly with families, and we see, you know, young families um, move into our developments, and, and we really want to build a great product and uh, and, and want to complete it as quick as we can so they can move in. So so every every month helps with that. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. we've also seen um, deals which have fallen over really in terms of they've not stacked up in terms of that profit on cost bit because they've locked in pre-sales too early. Um, yes. you know, they've, you know, it's really, really hampered the deal. So yeah, that's so true. Hmm. Excellent. Sorry, I interrupted. Please go ahead. <laughs> not at all. Um, so with commercial funding, we're, it's exactly the same deal. You're still buying the land for a million. You're still building for 1.1. Um, you're still selling the end product at uh, about 1.6 million. Uh, we've got we've put in a slightly high interest rate here at, at 8%. Um, and naturally, with a higher interest rate here, your profit uh, your profit goes down. So previously, where were we? Just over 500. We're just under 400 thousand dollars of profit. So you think, well, well yeah. Well, what, why do I why do I actually want to get commercial funding? Well, here's the thing: um, the equity required here is actually significantly less, and and it comes from two things. Um, one is the higher LVR that we can give potentially to a to a developer. Um, so what that means is we can lend more for for the exact same deal. And the second part of it is we're able to recognise potential uplift in in say the a, a DA for a, for a project. Say say you're purchasing this block of land for a million, you get a DA on it, and and, and overnight um, with the DA on it, because we've de-risked the project, um, it's recognized at say 1.1, 1.15, for example. So, so a combination of those things um, allows you to put less equity in. And what we're, what we're also um, uh, not highlighting here is that it's not relying on your serviceability. So you can do two or three uh, of, these, uh, of these deals at once. So I've done a bit of a comparison here with funding with traditional lenders on the one side, you're acquiring about seven hundred thousand dollars worth of equity. You've got profit of over five hundred, and your return on equity at seventy five percent. Whereas with funding with uh, the likes of commercial lenders like us, we we can we can look at um, roughly around the same amount of equity, um, around that seven hundred thousand dollar mark. But because you're doing two projects, your profit um, has soared uh, mm. over. 40 to 751,000 and of course your money is working harder for you that return on this on almost the same amount of equity is working at 101 percent as opposed to that 75 percent mm -hmm. um, so um daniel say for example um someone needs funding for the first mortgage and then and then a top up with the second mortgage what what is sort of the what are the rates on that this on average what would someone be expecting for a second mortgage for the yeah. extra what 10 or 15 percent would you go would you go that high yeah look it does it does vary with the deal and at what stage that um that funding is required um so if it's all required up front obviously it's it's a higher uh, uh risk perspective from the from the investor's perspective uh but if it's done throughout the process um, then obviously it's um, it, it's less risky and therefore the rates could be a little bit lower. Look, look, I would say look generally um, it, it would be double double digits, um, yeah. and I would say that um, that um, yeah that that's uh, commensurate with the with the uh, the risk that's that's taken there. Okay. I mean, certainly there's, for again, coming back to transparency, we've got investors on the other side of the platform. They'll be mm -hmm. looking for those higher returns because they've got to be the sophisticated investors to understand there is real risks potentially in, um, you know, mm -hmm. even if the best projects for the market downturn with second mortgage, um, it's it's not for everyone. Uh, but I would say on the other side of it, being able to deal with one lender, um, if you're looking for a first and second mortgage, there's, there's a real plus is that because you've only got one set of legals, you've only got one valuation required. Um, you know, you, you're talking to one stakeholder as opposed to trying to herd more finances. So mm -hmm. there are yeah. pluses to that too. Yeah. 
fabulous. We've got another question here um, from the audience. Do you have the appetite for lending to subdivision projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, uh, we've funded uh, one very recently, actually, um, uh, which is um, which is down South Australia way. So yeah, we're, we absolutely absolutely do anywhere from a one into two. It could be one into uh, thirty. It could be larger if, if it's broken into different stages as well. Um, mm. um, we may we may look at you know not considering a two thousand lot subdivision or anything like that. But but uh, but yeah, look, we're, we're happy to absolutely happy to look at subdivisions. Yeah, great. And Sabro's asked another question. How do you handle investor engagement? Uh, investor engagement, well, um, the platform's great because it provides the ability for you to log in and, and you know, as I was saying before, uh, decide which project you want to invest in by all this information is up and available on the website. Uh, we run a webinar with our uh, developers. You can meet them and their team. Uh, and then we do regular updates. So as the project progresses um, or our investors get an update so there's there's no surprises with projects um, you can see how they're tracking at each stage of the project so yeah plenty of information there awesome well let's let's um, head into the next case study there we've got townhouse development and let's see how this sort of compares yeah so we've spoken about up to this point about scaling up in terms of the number of projects, we've gone uh, from one project to two to potentially three. So, what about scaling up in terms of the size of projects? What, what about a uh, instead of a two townhouse development, we're, we're looking at a six townhouse development? So, mm. hypothetical Tim here is a builder developer um, who's done three of his own projects um, and potentially uh, potentially managed many, 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 many more as well. Um, he's got extensive PM knowledge and experience. He's looking to do bigger projects um, and he's looking to maximise profit. He's looking really to make his money work harder for him as well. He's perfectly capable of um, doing these larger projects. Um, he's looking for funding to, to, to do that project. So again, um, apologise in advance for the, for the numbers layout there, but just going through again some Basic economics, um, land acquisition is buying the land for 1.2 million. Construction cost is quite a bit higher because he's building six, uh, not just two now. Um, you've got um, more consultant fees, more compliance because there's more of them. Um, your in sales values, uh, you're looking at about just under 6 million for this particular example. Your total costs come to um, over 4 million. Your profit at 900,000. Again, a healthy margin of uh, 21.9. Now, um, again, that's that's funded. If that's done through us, we can look at uh, equity uh, amount of roughly, uh, say, seventeen percent. And again, we're wanting his money to work harder, so the return on equity is one hundred twenty nine percent there as as well. Um, so let's just do a quick comparison as we've done previously on funding the one larger deal versus funding the two smaller deals. So this example versus the last example of the two townhouse development. So interestingly, the equity required is actually very, very similar, um, whether you're doing the one larger deal or the or the two smaller deals. Your equity is, is around 700,000 or just over. Um, but because you're doing a larger project, your um, your return on equity and because you've, you, you're, you're putting in uh, less equity because of the high LVRs that we spoke about, you can essentially lever up more and you can essentially uh, make a higher profit compared to if you're uh, running two smaller projects. Now, the other thing is this argument, uh, Cheryl, that if you're doing one project versus two, that it's that it's also less work as well. Um, I, I would argue that's, that's a maybe because um, maybe two smaller projects are... Uh, are less work than one larger project, but that aside, at the end of the day, you're 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 pocketing more profit um, compared to if you're doing two smaller deals. Um, hope that hope that makes makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the last example here of um, of co living. So I just wanted to put that one in there uh, as it's um, it's something that we we're happy to look at and happy to look at funding 
Um, and so we'll use the hypothetical developer here of, of Sarah, who's um, completed six projects over the last five years. So she's done a fair few, but the banks don't get it. The banks don't get co-living. They don't understand why you're renting them out by room versus the whole uh, development. Um, they they just don't want to deal with it. They, they don't understand the, the requirements. They don't understand how people run it. Um, again, we're happy to, happy to look at that. Um, we're happy to look at recognizing valuations where they are where they are due um and you know for example this one here land acquisition at 700 cost to construct at 900 gross sales at 2.5 um 2.5 million if that was done just as a simple duplex we're, we're probably looking at about a 1.6 1.7 million dollar uh, gross sales but because of the income that's generated um it uses more of a cap rate um, so in this case, what, what have we got? A gross eight percent return, returning two hundred and four thousand. Now you've got to take some costs out of that, but um, but gee, that's not number, is it? If you if you if you just hold on to it, and you can see here, if you sold it, you make a profit of you know three hundred sixty two thousand, or you can hold on to it and um, and just get really really good cash flow, and which is why. Um, as you'll appreciate Cheryl why most people hold on to these things and and uh, don't like to don't like to sell them. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, we're um, we're going through this process and, and we're we're developing co living. Um, mm. We found it quite difficult to find funders who understood what we were looking to achieve, but mm. it made it made sense. Um, so the thing to point out for this sort of developments is that. You do need to have an exit strategy in terms of refinancing out of the construction loan. Yeah, correct, correct. We're happy to help with the settlement uh, when when you purchase. We're happy to help with the um, uh, with the construction uh, part of it. Um, but ultimately, yeah, ultimately you would want a, uh, an, an exit in mind um, because if you're holding it for whatever it may be five, ten, twenty years, um, a um, another lender can come in and and, um, and and become that financier for for that part of the journey awesome cameron's got another question would you fund say a one into three or four that is to lock up but the project needs to be completed seen of these piping up whereby small developers have gone bad three quarters through the deal i'm yeah. assuming that's a refinance uh, yeah that's a refinance play there but Oh, yeah, to you. yeah, de yeah. Um, developers and builders, right? Um, I mean, we, we're hearing in the news there's a few, few, um, few builders who are who are in a bit of strife um, at at the moment. Um, look, we're, it's it's not something that we say. Well, look, we 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 will fund any day that we can tick a box. It, it is something we're happy to have a discussion about. So if if that's happened on a scenario where developers um, gone bust or the builders gone bust, um, look, we're we're happy to happy to have a chat if um, if that helps and see how we can come in to to assist with that situation because ultimately um, both for the developer and the builder nothing happens when it just sits there mm. um, like um, you know the the end buyers aren't happy because they can't move in um, the builder's not getting paid and the developer can't exit the deal right it doesn't help anybody and we don't like to see that happen to anyone so we're happy yeah. to um, happy to assist where we where we can and certainly have a look at the deal for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a good point about the builder and how important they are. So part of our due diligence process, we look quite carefully at who the builder are, including right into their financials mm. um, and including them on the, on the documentation as well. So sometimes that comes a bit challenging, but it is very important. And, you know, the recent news is, is bearing that out. Um, I think that kind of project, if you're looking at stepping into it, you've got to, you know, you've got to realize the cost involved of any builder coming in and picking up that project is they don't know what risk they're taking on and therefore that's going to be reflected i'm sure in, in any quote you're looking at bringing into that so it's quite likely you're going to see those costs go up um but yeah, yeah. We, we'll look at any project on a project by project basis so if there's if there's one in particular yeah send it through <laughs> cool thank you so who can crowd property help Oh, I think we've we've probably touched upon it already, right? So if you we're looking for those people who are probably they might have done a, a project or or two or three or however many before, but they're really reaching that serviceability um, point where they're thinking about commercial lending. So if you wanna if you wanna look at funding bigger deals, uh, funding more deals, um, if 
as I say, you're hitting that, <laughs> that serviceability threshold and the banks are starting to say no for whatever reason. Um, and that could be just purely because they don't understand your deal, as we've kind of touched upon already. And then, as we've seen from the research, right, people are coming back time and time again to crowd property because of um, that relationship they've built. And it's a trusted um, relationship with a decision maker. Mm. Um, we, If you go to the website and read any of the testimonials, you'll see um, crowd property being described as almost having like an extra member of your development team, having them on board, because we want to see your project success. And that's right from the start, right through to the finish. So um, being able to tap into that expertise, it's a very different conversation to I've had in a former life uh, with, you know, traditional financiers lending, when it's just all about the term sheet, really. Mm. Yeah, and I think one of the things as well, uh, and I used to hear this quite a bit, where particularly with private private funding, that the the lenders were really looked at like sharks, where it was they, they were just waiting for the project to go bust, and then they come in and <laughs> basically take over, which is yeah. obviously <laughs> not what we're looking to achieve here um, by not having all those sort of um, special and and fees and interest rates that sort of are hiding hiding in the loan agreement. Um, yeah. so that, that's, that's a really important point to note as well. Uh, it comes back to, you know, if we make a project success, it's successful for the developer, it's successful for the investors, it's successful for the platform. Yeah. Um, our model is not, you know, as you say, to sit here and wait until something falls over and then perhaps we can step in and take all the equity out of it as well. Um, yeah. You know, we do have first mortgage rights. We do have a tripartite agreement with the builder and the developer to protect our investors' interests. But the best person to work out a project is, is the developer in conjunction with the financier in that mm -hmm. situation rather than trying to start again. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. So, I mean, I mean there are a few people that are on on the, the call today and on the episode. So, really, you know, if you've got any, any projects that you just like to run by, um, the projects team or Daniel, uh, you've got some contact details there, projects at crowdproperty.com.au. And if you so feel inclined and you're missing um, scanning in your QR codes when you go to the shopping centre, uh, <laughs> point your phone at your computer screen now. Um, probably a little bit hard if you're watching from your mobile. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that I think that was really, again, I, I I really like what it is that you guys are doing. Um, we've got our projects that are getting funded by Crowd Property, um, and it is a co-living project. Uh, the experience has been been very, very good. It has been very pleasant working with with the team. And like you said, it really feels like if there's anything, if you've got concerns or um, whatever that might be, the fact is that you've always been there to really talk things through. And it's always around finding solutions. It's not about finding excuses to um, finding excuses to, like I said, you know, to be a shark and come in and take over a project. It's always around how can we make this make this happen. Um, so I do do highly recommend if you've got a project um, and you're coming out of sort of residential finance and diving into the commercial lending space and you're not quite sure who to speak to um just reach out to daniel or david they've got their details there and um and just i guess see where it goes yeah great well thank you cheryl it's as I say, it's not very often you'll you hear those kind words about financiers so um no maybe that proves the model is bearing out so um as i said uh, we're looking forward to funding much more projects we've got a lot of investors behind the platform now we're getting excited about better returns um over high quality Fabulous. projects um, so that also on the other side of it you know if you're not quite ready but um you know you want to get involved with funding some projects if you jump on crowdproperty.com.au, you can go and um, you know invest in the projects and scratch your property itch and feel like you might be part of the deal. So um, yeah. yeah. Before we before we wrap up, um, what is sort of the sweet spot for crowd property in terms of um, the deal size? Okay. Yeah, so uh, we can fund you know anywhere between your two hundred and fifty thousand dollar on the lower end up to five million uh, plus uh, deal sizes. So so happy to. to like what, what we don't look at is $100 million deals. I think those deals are very well funded by people other than other than us. Um, but if you've got a project that you're thinking about funding, we're, we're happy to have that 
have that conversation. So there's no do, deal too small. There are deals too too big, obviously, but, uh, but happy to happy to look at deals as they as they come up and this is where we can. So the the small scale development finance sort of um, specialists, I probably say, if if you're in that small, you know, in that that scale of and renovations as well. Would it, yep. you do look at renovations? Yeah, renovations, okay. special renos, cosmetic renos. Um, again, we assess the deals uh, on its own merit um, and provided the deal stacks up and there's, you know, in the developer um, uh, or the renovator is the, mm. it sees a good good project, then we're happy to, very happy to back them. Okay, um, excellent. Thank some you. Good opportunities out there. Thanks, yeah, you're a deal for just outside of that. Um, that threshold just get in touch anyway we've got investors behind us who are interested in the bigger deals as well so we can generally generally help out there too yeah wonderful mm -hmm. thanks daniel thanks david appreciate that and everyone that has joined us and asked questions um uh, really appreciate your your input and make sure if you really enjoyed that session and you'd like to tune into more business of property sessions um subscribe to our youtube channel it is under the business of property or you can search cheryl leong uh, make sure you visit and you can find all our past uh, business of property videos if you found value in today make sure you hit the like button so till next week take care goodbye stay safe and stay dry and we'll see you again next time Bye bye